Hello, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second uh, and last section of the day. Yeah, it's been a long way since yesterday, but uh, we are here. And I'm hoping that uh, all of us have been enjoying ourselves with the wonderful talks and the wonderful presentation so far. Uh, without uh, any further ado, I would like to uh, hand over uh, the presentation floor to the first person. Uh, the format for our presentation will be 15 minutes. Uh, each presenter will have 15 minutes and then five minutes from the discussant and five minutes for a general q and A. I, I beg our discussants and also our presenters to, uh, to try your best to stick to the time because we'll have a closing section immediately after uh, 5.30. So it will be a, a little bit unfair on other team. We take up their time or we are still in section when other people are already in the closed section. So I really beg everybody to try to, to the best of your ability and stick to the time allocated to you. Without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over then the floor to the first presenters, uh, Jishun Bain from Carlington University and Saros Kuru Villa uh, on corporate social responsibility and wages in the apparent and uh, foodware supply chains. The floor Thank is you. yours. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jin Sun Bay. Uh, I work at Carlton University in Canada, and, I, and I'm happy to Sorry, present- Sorry, Jishun, we can't hear yeah. you. Oh, you cannot hear me? Uh, is my voice coming through? I can hear you. Okay, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Okay, good, good. Yeah, so he hello once again, everyone. My name is Jin Sun Bei. Uh, I'm happy to present my work in progress with my co-author, Professor Saros Kruvilla at Cornell University. And I think there seems to be a little discrepancy between the program and what I'm about to present, but actually, uh, we are focusing on wage issues in the global apparel supply chain. So it's going to be about apparel supply chain, not apparel and footwear supply chain. Let's see whether I can share screen. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Thank you for the confirmation. Okay, then I can move on. So, so as we all know, private labor regulation has been a popular CSR practice of many apparel companies since the 1990s. And in this paper, uh, we specifically focus on the issue of wages um, because wage is a key item in any code of conduct. And typically the code stipulates that workers should earn at least legal minimum wage or industry standard, whichever is higher um, by workers working regular hours without overtime. There are a small number of academic and NGO studies examining these wage issues. Uh, and in general, <clears throat> these studies offer mixed evidence uh, as to whether lead firms' private labor regulation has improved wage levels at the supplier level. So, um, which is briefly mentioned in the slide here. Um, but I want to point out that the 2016 study conducted by the Fair Labor Association um, is a rare multi-country comparative study on wage levels in its member supplier factories. And this study suggests an anchoring effect whereby um, the country's minimum wage tends to anchor or affect um, the level of wages paid by suppliers. So supplier wages then tend to be between one and 1.5 times of the applicable legal minimum wage. And as the reports of substandard wages continue to persist, in recent years, workers, NGOs, and lately investors have increased their pressure upon global companies to pay a living wage. Uh, and the living wage is conventionally defined as a wage that covers necessities such as food and housing and provides some discretionary income for the worker and the family. There have been some company experiments and industry-wide initiatives such as ACT, uh, focusing on living wage issues, but according to NGO and media reports so far, 
these promises have seemed to be uh, seem to have been left unfulfilled. So as we review the extent literature so far, we came to recognize that first of all, academic studies on wages tend to examine wage violations as reported in supplier audits. Um, and this information tells us whether workers were paid correctly or on time, but lack quantitative information about wage levels. Um, second, we can obtain information on wage levels from NGO reports, um, but their study samples tend to be small, unrepresentative, or lacking a, compar uh, lacking a comparative flair. So to address this knowledge gap, we set out to provide a more systematic analysis on wage levels in global apparel supply chains using multi-country, multi-year data. And our research objective is made up of two, oh, sorry, three interrelated questions. So first two questions concern the sufficiency of actual wages in the global apparel supply chains. So we examine whether wages increase over time and constitute living wages. And taking one step further, um, for our last question, we want to look at factors that can induce wage increase. So uh, inspired by some studies in labor relations um, that examine how unionized workplaces offer higher wages than non-unionized workplaces, we examined whether wages paid by suppliers uh, would be higher uh, if these suppliers operate in countries that offer stronger protection of freedom of association rights. We leverage our unique access to a uh, company's own wage data to examine these questions. So the primary data comes from a social auditing company, which we call ODCO, uh, we gave it a pseudonym. The global lead firm subcontract uh, their supplier audits to ODCO, and this company gave us um, their supplier audit data that includes wage information for over 9,000, uh, um, encompassing 9, 000, over 9,000 audits uh, conducted during 2011 to 2018 in the six countries mentioned here. And each audit reported the average wage paid and the applicable local minimum wage in local currencies. Um, one major limitation of this data is that it does not allow us to identify and track individual factories. So we took this uh, factory level wage data and analyzed it at the country level. Our second data comes from a US-based apparel retailer, which we call Pangea. And this company supply chain extends to over 20 countries in Asia and in Latin America. And the company, uh, granted us access to their uh, wage data from 2016, uh, no, sorry, 262 supplier factories in 2016. And this data is useful as a source of triangulation for our analysis based on OTCO data. And also this data gives us a glimpse into what wages are like in the supply chain of a global retailer that has promised in its code of conduct to pay a wage that can afford the workers some discretionary income. And lastly, uh, unlike Otco's data, Pangea's data offers a detailed breakdown of wages by items. So let me start by tackling the first question that concerns wage levels and wage growth over time. So here we analyzed average monthly base wages by country and year from 2011 to 2017 in the old code data. So by monthly base wage, uh, I refer to the monthly wage workers earned by working a standard work week without overtime. And these monthly base wages are reported in uh, its uh, local currencies in gray cells. And from a glance, you can see that the nominal values of uh, monthly base wages ha have increased over time. Meanwhile, numbers in italics are the percentage difference between monthly base wage and legal minimum wage. And unlike the nominal, val nominal values of monthly base wages, percentage differences um, did not increase in co constantly, but rather they seem to fluctuate. Another way of evaluating the sufficiency of wages is to examine their real wage values. So 
we converted monthly base wages reported in local currencies to 2017 US dollars for comparison across countries. And as you can see, a constant yearly increase is something that's missing in this graph. So countries either fluctuated or achieved only a minimal increase over a seven year period. And this graph suggests to us that working regular hours may not compensate workers sufficiently to handle the increases in their cost of living. And in fact, academic and NGO studies have documented the pervasive use of overtime by workers, criticizing how substandard base wage makes overtime basically a forced necessity. And luckily, our Pangea data offers hard evidence into how much overtime work accounts for workers' monthly take-home pay. So overtime earnings account for nearly a third of take-home pay in China, India, and Indonesia, and Pakistan. And in other countries, overtime earnings ranges from 18 to 20, 30% of their take-home pay. So these numbers illustrate that overtime earning plays a substantial role in boosting workers' take-home pay and subsequently increases the attractiveness of overtime work to workers. So now we move on to understand whether uh, page, uh, wages paid by suppliers are comfortably above the poverty line and meet living wage estimates. And all these estimates I used here are in purchasing power parity dollars. And here we use the old cost data from 2017 because one of the estimates uh, became available from 2017. And for the poverty line estimate, we use the World Bank's international poverty lines. And for living, oh, and then for the poverty line, we assume that the monthly base wage should be able to cover um, the poverty line for two people, so the worker and another family member at the least. For living wage, we used two benchmarks. So Asia floor wage offers one regional benchmark, and we have also applied it to Mexico. Wage indicator offers country-specific benchmarks for all countries except China. And uniquely, their uh, estimates are in ranges with lower bound and higher bound. We used both lower and higher uh, bounds for a country. So the higher estimate assumes the workers to afford median living costs, while the lower estimate assumes the worker to seek cheaper than average costs of food, housing, et cetera. We compare this poverty line and living wage estimates with the, with the average monthly base wage, which is in light gray and monthly take-home pay in dark gray. And take-home pay here includes overtime earning, bonuses, um, after deductions, et cetera. So first, the minimum wages earned by apparel workers in Bangladesh and Mexico fell below the poverty line estimate for two people. And second, the lower estimate of wage indicators was the most conservative estimate we used for living wage. But except in Indonesia and Vietnam, monthly base wages did not meet this benchmark. And third, as you can see, there is a noticeable gap between monthly base wage and take home pay. If, for example, in uh, China or Vietnam, indicating how overtime earning continues to play a key role in bumping worker wages. Even then, uh, uh, countries like Bangladesh, India, and Mexico, we see that monthly take-home pays did not exceed the lowest living wage benchmark. To, to summarize, this comparative exercise shows that the base wage based on an eight-hour working day would have to increase by a considerable margin to realize a living wage for apparel workers in these six countries. Our final question concerns whether actual wages were higher in countries with better institutional support for freedom of association rights. So for this, we fitted two panel regression models to test whether country level protection of freedom of association led to higher wages paid by suppliers in the following year. So in the interest of time, I'll be brief on methodological description here. So the dependent variable for model one is the log the value of monthly base wage in purchasing power parity dollars. 
And to account for the possible anchoring effect of legal minimum wage on the wage paid by suppliers, model two uses a different de dependent variable that is the log ratio of monthly base wage to the legal minimum wage. In both models, predictor variables are countries' freedom of association scores in the labor rights indicator database developed by two scholars, Pusera and Sari. And we use the two scores here. So one is countries' FOA violation in law, and which measures the degree to which countries' national laws deviates from the international standard on freedom of association. FOA violation in practice um, measures the severity of violations in practice as reported in several textual sources. So for both predictor variables, a higher score means a higher deviation, meaning less institutional support for freedom of association rights. And then we used um, a selection of controls and year dumps. From these two panel models, we find that countries' protection of FOA rights in practice affects the absolute amount of monthly base wage, as well as its relative amount to the legal minimum wage in the following year. So, so first, countries' FOA violation in practice was the only predictor variable that was statistically significant in both models. A 10-point increase in the freedom of association practice violation score was associated with 7.3% decline in the base wage and 6.1% decline in the ratio of base wage to legal minimum in the following year. So for a context, 10 points roughly represent the difference between Bangladesh and India on the labor rights indicator database. It is worth noting that country's violation in law was not statistically significant, thus suggesting that country's legal alignment to international freedom of association standard alone would not guarantee better protection of these rights in practice. Second, average overtime hours per week was the only control variable that was significant in both models. And this negative association makes intuitive sense, suggesting that factories prone to excessive overtime may keep its base wages low because overtime tends to be 1.5 to two times of the base wage. So we summarize our answers to the three questions on the left side here. And we believe this study makes a strong empirical contribution by analyzing companies' own data that covers multiple countries and years. And in doing so, it offers hard evidence of the decoupling between corporate promises and worker realities on, it, on the issue of wages. <clears throat> and this conclusion makes it clear that lead firms' private labor regulation alone does not guarantee a living wage, let alone a consistent and meaningful increase of wages in real terms. So we call for actions at multiple levels, leveraging lead firms purchasing practices, regular, regulatory pressure from the apparel production uh, country, and industry level collective bargaining based on uh, worker empowerment. And this concludes my presentation. And thank you so much for your attention and interest. Thank you very much. Uh for the nice presentation. So we just move uh, straight into the discussion now. Yeah, Sanjita, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this uh, paper. Um, this is a really important paper and it makes um, you know, critical interventions. As the authors argue, data on wages is rare and we actually don't have adequate information about whether retailers are meeting what is really a basic need as they often claim to do. And we also know that paying adequate wages would actually make a real difference for workers and it would go beyond sort of these you know, typically the structural considerations that are focused on, whether it's building safety, fire safety, you know, what typically CSR programs tend to focus on, it takes us beyond the, this very basic idea of worker safety and actually gets at these ideas of livelihoods and security. 
Um, of course, decent wages are also something that workers themselves want. I mean, constantly, if you talk to workers or labor rights um, activist groups, there that's what they say. You know, don't give us, um, you know, don't give us all these sort of empowerment programs. You know, just pay us a, a decent wage, and and that's what we need. And of course, during COVID, we know that when workers were not paid, even for a period of time, how extremely detri detrimental it was for their livelihoods. Um, I think the paper also provides a very strong case to pay a living wage and sort of discusses that gap between what is what is set as a minimum wage and what an actual living wage would mean. And it also bolsters, bolsters the argument that countries that measure high on freedom of association will perhaps would tend to pay higher wages. And this is another area where there has been sort of little improvement over the years. So I just have a few sort of small points and then, then maybe some kind of larger issues. So, you know, some, some quick sort of observations. One is, um, you know, it, in this paper, given, uh, you know, the timing, it would be great to actually put in some, um, you know, recent data. There's, for example, some data from the Business and Human Rights Resource Center about the impact of COVID and on wages, because I think that would just contextualize it more. That would actually strengthen your argument that because wages are so low, huge shock like COVID, you know, how detrimental it actually is. And there's some really good data by a recent report actually was the um, looking at several countries in Asia, and I'm, I'm happy to send that to you if you, if you don't have that one. Um, so I did, I think that would just be add, you know, to your, to your argument. Um, a few things I wasn't sure of, you know, I mean, these are minor points. I think one of the controls, um, when, when you control for, uh, the growth of the country's apparel industry from the last year, assuming that suppliers would be more open to increased base wages, I'm not sure if that's exactly true. I mean, I'm not sure if that that really does play out. I mean, thinking of a country like Bangladesh, that has been very successful, but I mean, the pressure to keep low wages down is, is continuously uh, year after year. I don't, I, I'm not sure if that is, is a, a strong, you know, it's a correlation, but that, I mean, that's just a minor point. The other issue is, you know, the overtime issue and low wages. I mean, I think that has to be analyzed a little bit more in the sense that I, I agree when you're saying that we're, um, you know, because wages are so low, we're seeing more overtime because workers are, you know, taking on overtime to make up for the low wages. But I, I, I think it's, it's a much um, more complex sort of argument there. I mean, I think it's actually, you know, workers are oftentimes forced to do it. They're actually threatened uh, with violence if they don't. They're actually threatened for job losses if they don't. And this all ties back to, you know, excessive overtime happens because of the, the purchasing practices, um, really. So I, I don't, I sort of don't, wouldn't frame it as sort of a choice of workers. They have, yes, they're getting more um, pay, but the, the impact of overtime on workers and just sort of their health and, and, and physical and mental stability, I think is, is, I think now we know it's extremely great. And this is an area that hasn't changed. So I don't know, that's something that I would maybe sort of re, maybe recontextualize just the discussion of. Then I think, you know, the paper, it, it, rightly says that you know this is this is top line aggregate data and it, it again the paper is very clear about where the um sort of the shortfalls are and and i think you know having this aggregate data it sort of misses certain nuances which i think are critical to the story but also to eventually um see change so again and this is not to say i mean i think the paper itself really it does what it sets out to do. Um, yes, uh, okay, I have to wrap up. So just very quickly, um, you know, I think that the freedom of association data does, you know, of course, and, you know, it, it's very top line data and it does not really capture on the ground realities. And of course it doesn't get at what individual factories, um, you know, many of them are very repressive. Some are not, there's, there's sort of a wide range. You know, these kind of measures are very hard. I remember after Rana Plaza, they suddenly started saying, oh, you know, there's so many unions being established and they use that number as a, as a example of, you know, increased freedom. But of course the, the repression on workers 
post menopause has been far greater than what was happening before. So I, I think those are nuances that it, you know, obviously top level data doesn't, um, doesn't get to. And I mean, the main thing is, you know, we're, it, it doesn't, it's not getting at the sort of variation among suppliers. So we don't get an understanding of why certain suppliers may have the ability to pay um, workers adequate wages, you know, we, it doesn't get at necessarily why purchasing practices might inhibit that. It also doesn't get at the fact that why some suppliers just simply resist paying adequate wages, even the, the minimum wages that are set. I mean, they resist that constantly. Um, and why, you know, uh, for example, in, in countries where the, the factory owners are actually very close to the government, they actually don't mean you know, they block any sort of um, even even discussion of raising the wage. So uh, these are just sort of you know other nuances that it it just that's playing out um, on the ground. That of course this this level of data doesn't get to. And I think you know partly I wonder if I mean just I'll end here. I wonder if you know the paper is is a very important intervention, but it also might be kind of supporting the argument that brands make with respect to wages. They, they, they tend to say, well, we're paying kind of the minimum wage. I mean, we're doing what we're supposed to do. We all know that that's not adequate, but I feel like you know, the brand, it's, it, it does sort of bolster that argument um, for the brands to say that we are doing what is basically required of us. So I'm sorry, I, I, want, I took more time, but I, I'll, I'll end there. But it was a, it's a great paper, so thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, on, unfortunately, uh, Bay, uh, I will encourage you maybe to touch base with uh, Sanchita, you know, outside and have some bilateral contact with her. But we need to move on to the next presentation for for time. So I just want to briefly thank Sanchita for a very like thorough uh, discussion, and I will follow up with her uh, independently. Mm. Thank you very much for your understanding. So please, uh, we move to the next presentation. And please, um, the audience also, the, the chat is open in case you have questions. I mean, we can continue the conversation there. All right, so the, the next presenter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, sorry, I'll just get my presentation up. Sorry, I think I'm disconnected. Hello? We can answer your slides yet. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Sorry, I'm having a problem. My computer is frozen and my image is frozen. Okay. Um, we can uh, just move to the next presenter while she tries to figure out if that is okay by everybody. Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, that's so. That would be me and Doro. I'm. Yes. Yes. Please. Yeah. A am I able to share? Yes. Rachel, you should you need be able to stop to. Uh, the sharing. Um, My Rachel. computer is frozen. Oh, it just unfroze. Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, Perfect. Uh, should I present now or? Yes, yes, yeah, you can, you can, you can. Yeah. Okay. Oh. No, I'm still having problems. Oh, sorry, can the next presenter? <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, I, I computer's think. It's freezing when I try and share. Yeah, I'll so I, I will it. suggest. <laughs> I will suggest the next presenter, and then after her, you can come on board. Yeah. And even if I can also share your screen, on, 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 I can share my screen with your slides on your behalf. So for the sake of time, we just move to the next presenter. Yeah. Okay, so I'll I'll share my screen then. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, can everyone can see, right? Um, Doro, you're there? I'm here, yes, and okay. I can see. Hi, <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So I think everyone can see our, 
presentation. So um, thank you everyone for being here and um, nice to see you, Doro. Uh, we have been working, well, we've been talking about this for, for some time. And actually this was a great opportunity to work on this paper together. And, and we are fortunate to be able to present today. I just want to say very clearly, these are very, you know, it's very early. Um, this is some sort of you know, we've been sort of playing around with these ideas and we have some really, I think what we think is very interesting evidence, but again, this is an early, early sort of draft um, of the paper. So we look forward to feedback and comments and we hope to sort of develop this uh, further as time allows. So our paper, our presentation is titled COVID-19 is the tipping point, transforming business models in the global garment industry. So I'll present a few slides and then Dora will come in and then we'll sort of uh, take it take it from there. Um, so just very quickly at this, some of the preliminary sort of putting it in context, generally, you know, we, we believe that global supply chains are inherently detrimental to good labor rights. We've seen this in various contexts over the last several decades. Some of the characteristics of global supply chains that are inherently kind of built into the structure, lack of information, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, the hyper flexibility, unequal power relationships, all kind of, you know, they, they're necessary for supply chains to work the way that they're supposed to. But of course, these are in direct conflict with good human rights and good labor rights. So of course, you know, having a large global pandemic that's affected literally every corner of the world, just simply put these un what were already unfair practices, it put a, a real sort of spotlight and focus on them. And it basically heightened, heightened inequalities that were already present. So with respect to the garment industry in particular, and this is some, um, you know, similar to this, I had some data I had just suggested to um, the, the first presenter, you know, a lot of data was coming out during the time of COVID and what the impacts of order cancellations were on suppliers and then ultimately workers. So this is just some data, you know, and because of lack of time, I won't go through all of this, but, you know, it was pretty shocking, you know, 75% of suppliers basically reported that they had to cut workers hours as a result of buyer purchasing practices during the pandemic. And then, you know, there's other data um, that, that was pretty, pretty striking, actually. And it gets to the, this sort of question, I mean, ultimately, who holds the power in this relationship? This is a, a you know, off the record quote from a major, um, from, the, from a head of uh, labor and human rights at a major retailer, who said in, in the context of the larger interview, that it's an open secret, frankly, that cancellations, I think, are more common than people think. If a shipment arrives and it doesn't meet any of our quality standards, or if the vendor says, okay, well, the shipment is going to be three months late, we and any other company out there retain the right to, for specifically prescribed reasons, to cancel the orders. And that's just how the apparel business works. So his point was, you know, we shouldn't be so shocked by what is happening. It just seemed that a lot was happening in terms of cancellations all over the world, certain, suddenly at one time. But this is actually kind of built into the system. And this is, as he says, just how the apparel business works. So thinking about all this, and then of course, thinking about COVID and kind of the, the you know, how it wrecked havoc really, you know, um, for global supply chains and workers around the world, we wanted to think about, you know, what types of structural change changes are needed. And we know that um, there's, there's some really great examples of some legislative changes happening in the EU. There is, there is some slight movement towards changes in contracts, changes in the way you know, um, contracts are, are written up. But today we wanna to talk more about sort of business model changes and actually changes in the way business is done. And particularly looking at the idea of transitioning from a more transactional business model to a more direct partnership. And so I'll have Doro. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks, Sanchita. It's great to do this with you and it's great to be with all of you today. Um, so Sanchita mentioned the changes in business models that we are trying to track and that's something, a transition that we observed um, already prior to COVID, which we now believe will accelerate. And so let me just briefly walk you through this table to highlight what constitutes a typical transaction sourcing model versus what we consider 
the more advantageous from a human rights perspective partnership model. So it all starts with the time horizon um, of committing to source um, in a partnership model compared to a transaction sourcing model, the time horizon is significantly longer um, versus a transaction sourcing model has no future commitments to source from the same supplier. Um, for many companies, this is the only characteristic that um, constitutes a partnership, and that's insufficient. Um, we have, um, based on observations in Bangladesh and Ethiopia, put together other characteristics um, that are just as important that we would say the time horizon is a necessary but insufficient condition to form a true partnership with uh, a supplier. What's also important is the actual relationship, how frequently um, do they interact, what's the level of communication, um, and uh, are they actually planning business together? Is it a joint business planning or is it simply a communication to what uh, an order forecasting? That's what many brands are now doing, but uh, that's not joint planning. It's just order forecasting. On the pricing, um, we have seen with one supplier that they very radically say, we don't want to negotiate prices. It costs what it costs and we want to be transparent about our costing models. Most important in a context like Ethiopia is how to deal with the workforce um, that's entirely new to an industrialized context. And so skill development is key, investing in the skill development. Um, uh, this is what eventually will drive up productivity. Um, and with increased productivity, also wages can then um, go up. Um, and to get there, one key, which we've seen in multiple locations, is to bring down employee turnover, because otherwise the investments in training will be lost if more than 100% of the workforce leaves um, a facility uh, each year. So by uh, more creative models to hold <laughs> employees, for example, by paying bonuses, um, loyalty bonuses, productivity bonuses, if workers stay longer, they contribute to greater productivity, which can eventually also lead up to greater wages. And we've seen that playing out in a positive way in a number of um, contexts. Next slide, please. So then we ask ourselves, indeed, um, will COVID be the turning point for companies to move from a transaction model to a partnership model with their suppliers? We've seen, as I said, the shift beginning already prior to um, COVID, maybe motivated by you know, major accidents like Rana Plaza, but we think this could now accelerate. Next slide, please, because <laughs> um, first of all, um, there's greater um, focus on supply chain resilience than ever. So um, as uh, some brands had established those partnerships prior to the pandemic, we saw them um, weathering the storm together um, better than others. And they frequently communicated with their suppliers. Um, they made sure that um, they survived the crisis. They gave them more flexibility, what to do with the produced goods. They immediately committed to paying for the orders. They wanted to make sure that they can pick up business with those suppliers in which they invested in immediately again, once the crisis calms down. Um, Another uh, factor that we think uh, will accelerate this shift to a partnership model is a growing interest of consumers to consume differently. It's still a niche, but it's a growing niche. Um, and uh, the predictions based on you know, McKinsey models, et cetera, all point into that direction that consumption models will change. Other important factors, particularly in Europe, certainly is the emergence, and Sanjita has mentioned that, of human rights due diligence legislation as companies are now required by the law to conduct human rights due diligence. This will be much easier with a supplier who is an actual partner and who allows to uh, join forces when it comes to the remediation of uh, violations and challenges. With non-partners, um, the remediation will be very difficult. And then another driving factor we believe is the S in ESG, the general interest in ESG, environmental social governance data, and the social dimension covers human rights aspect. And as investors are asking brands to report on ESG, well, the reporting is much more difficult. I actually don't exactly know where your stuff comes from and how these suppliers are doing. So reporting on the S with partners will be much easier than with uh, 
transactional in transactional relationships with suppliers. Next slide. So I'll go through a couple more. Um, so our our the the primary data for this paper was really um, uh, you know qualitative uh, analysis of of uh, several interviews we did in depth interviews with um, with uh, global retailers um, based in in uh, based in the U S and in in Europe um, who basically in it was in the con larger context of under trying to understand the situation during COVID and the actions that the retailers took, but also a lot of uh, future oriented types of questions that we asked, really trying to get them to talk about, you know, how do they see the industry going and where do they see their own retailer strategy. Um, so we just just a couple of slides to give some some flavor of the types of um, conversations that we had. Um, so in the short term, as Dora mentioned, you know, the the it came out consistently that there were the direct and closer relationships will actually be necessary for handling this current crisis and for dealing with the immediate impact. So this is a quote from a major retailer who said, um, you need to keep those long term partnerships in order to improve working conditions and environmental conditions. And I'm just um, going a little bit further down, uh, you know, talking about how they dealt with every vendor during this crisis. And he says, we, we pick up, picked up the phone and we said, look, this is what is happening. This is where we are. Tell us where you are because we share vendors with other brands. So this, so what is happening and how can we help and how can we get out of this? So this kind of really exemplifies this idea of this short term, in the short term, we need to have a close partnership with our suppliers. Otherwise, both of us together are not going to be, if, we're, if we are you know, sort of very distant and we don't communicate and we don't work together, we're not going to get out of this current crisis. So this was something that we we heard often about, you know, what what is the kind of the value that they see for these long term partnerships, just really for the immediate term. And then in the long term, we saw, for example, this, you know, really um, global retailers really talking about the partnership model, giving more leverage to their suppliers um, or giving them more leverage with their suppliers to make concrete changes, both with, you know, and, and with environmental issues and with labor issues. So another supplier said, uh, another retailer says, sustainability is very expensive and it takes a lot of time to build up sustainability capabilities in a given supply. Uh, it should be, sorry, given supply chain around the world. We need to invest in wastewater treatment plants and invest in green chemistry. We need to invest in the workers' well being. We need to invest in climate change and solar panels or renewable energy. For us, shifting from one supplier to another could impact our long term goals. So they are also seeing that having this strong partnership will actually make sustainability, um, you know easier relatively for them. And because as Dora mentioned earlier, you know, there are, they are facing pressures on the on this S, the S of ESG, we're going to see this this shift because because it's actually a necessity um, as they start grappling with these issues um, over time. Oh, Dora, you're muted. Sorry about that. So this is not utopian um, to set up these partnerships because some brands are indeed doing it. I've conducted a case study of Decathlon, um, the largest, uh, the fastest growing uh, sports retailer um, in Europe. And um, they take this idea of a partnership very far. Um, I've not seen that level of commitment um, by anyone else yet in the industry. Um, they draw up a five-year joint business plan, accepting that in the first years, they might not make a profit, neither the supplier nor the brand. Um, but over five years, they see uh, well gains for every side. Um, they also understand that to build up a workforce requires a, a program. So not just training, but also sending simple styles first and then gradually up the skill level as so they are adjusting the types of orders they request from new suppliers. 
Um, I mentioned before, they're uh, also paying loyalty bonuses and uh, trying creative ways to up the wage immediately. And then also hopefully um, increase the wage base level over time. Um, in Ethiopia, where I uh, went to see their factory, that had already happened. Um, during the crisis, indeed, they maintained a really strong relationship with their, with their suppliers. Um, they sent planning updates, assuring suppliers that business with them will start again. Of course, they paid for the existing orders. And um, they also, um, then once it was possible again, prioritized those strategic suppliers as production for the next business to stabilize these relationships and ensure that those businesses make it through the crisis. Um, so that's a remarkably different business approach to the more typical transactional business model. Um, but you may ask, why hasn't, if everything's so perfect, why hasn't every company not yet switched to this partnership model? There are also challenges um, for both sides. Um, Decathlon clearly told me the biggest challenge for growing the partnership model um, is to identify appropriate suppliers. They're currently producing 80% uh, of their products with strategic suppliers, um, but finding suppliers that are willing to go all the way with them um, and fully committing to this joint, almost joint venture uh, is apparently the hardest part. Um, from a buyer's perspective, reducing, consolidating the supply chain uh, means of course that they have fewer chances to spread risks um, and um, uh, the investments also can be lost if one of the suppliers um, doesn't make it. Um, vice versa for the supplier, they certainly then commit to producing for one buyer for like they reserve more than 50% of the production capacity for one buyer. Um, and so the fate of the supplier is bound to the success of the buyer to a large degree. They also need to agree that the buyer then intervenes in their business um, to a point that they, uh, yeah, they're true partners. Um, and not all suppliers maybe want that. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think for Decathlon, the most difficult thing apparently is to identify suppliers that are willing to commit for five years to go that path with um, Decathlon together. All right, let's conclude here. So what all this is based on anecdotal evidence and many interviews we've conducted. Um, it's certainly the initial experience shows that this partnership makes good business sense for both the supplier and the brand. But of course we need um, more longer term data that confirms these initial positive indications, including an assessment of whether the partnership model truly contributes to socioeconomic development, for example, um, in uh, for example, in, in the context that I investigated Ethiopia. And we, I think we need more empirical research on the individual elements of this partnership model. So we need to have a better understanding of what makes good a good purchasing practice, um, which elements um, really make a difference. Um, and how do they need to be designed concretely to benefit, to create this win-win-win for workers, suppliers, and the brand. And for that, we need more specific um, purchasing order data, I think from the um, uh, brands and ideally uh, multiple years over time. All right, I'll stop here and look forward to comments and questions. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, you're muted. Yeah, thank you very much. So I will just uh, hand over to the discussant. Yeah, so please just use about three minutes just to hit to the point because we are running out of time. Yeah, so just yeah. go straight to the point so that we can move to the next presentation. Okay. Yeah, so I think this is um, a really interesting paper and it's very needed at this time. It's something I have been writing about recently too, the need to have stronger relationships. So the fact that you're actually looking at how are these happening? When are these happening? What are the drivers? That's very interesting and very valuable. Um, it's great that you have contemporary data happening right now during the Corona pandemic. Um, some of my comments are one thing you say, will this um, be a turning point? I would suggest maybe you wanna say, can this be a turning point? It seems very predictive to say, will. Um, 
And another issue I thought is that so you present um, all these reasons why COVID will create this change and then kind of as an afterthought or at least secondly, you go on to talk about these longer term trends. I think it might be helpful to talk about the longer term trends and how things have been building up and then saying how is Corona going to build on to that and how is that going to push potentially push these businesses over the tipping point. Um, in the paper, when you talked about um, the businesses working with strategic suppliers, I assumed that the strategic suppliers would be a very small number. Like when I've talked to companies in the past, they might have 20 strategic suppliers out of 500. So I was quite surprised in, in the presentation when you said 80% of the Catalan supply is coming from strategic suppliers. Yeah. No, it was 80% oh. of the products of the yeah. Are produced eighty yeah. percent of products, products not eighty yeah. percent of suppliers. Yeah. it's a much smaller number, yeah. much smaller percentage, indeed. But yeah, so I think it would be um, interesting to talk about um, the differences between what are the relationships they have with strategic suppliers versus non-strategic suppliers, and how do those balances um, exist? Um, and is it feasible for firms to only have strategic suppliers? That was just a question I had. Um, and then if they're going to have only um, strategic suppliers, is it going to be a much smaller supplier base then instead of hundreds, are they, those 20 going to be able to do all of their production or are those hundreds of other firms providing things they need one offs and very specialized skills so can it exist with just the strategic suppliers. Um, sorry. Oh, I also was wondering. Um, a bit more about the brands that you talk to, not necessarily giving up confidentiality, of course, but maybe you could say some examples of the sizes of them, what are their revenue, how many suppliers do they have, some kind of indication of who are these firms and what does their supply look like right now, what countries are they sourcing from potentially. Um, and then I had another um, quite specific question, but it kind of gets into methodology. At one point you say, brands were less likely to take harmful actions, including canceling already finished orders or asking for discounts if they had partnerships. When you say they're less likely, um, that makes me think something quantitative. And yeah, I don't know, like, how can you justify that? Or can you give more specific examples? Is it just one or two brands have done that? Yeah, I was just kind of wondering about that. And that leads into my final comment, which I think it could be interesting to have some kind of charts or tables that compare maybe what businesses were doing before and after COVID or any patterns you see or differences between how they deal with their strategic versus their non-strategic suppliers. Or I'm particularly looking at if you can identify any changes around the COVID period that would fit with your whole argument. And possibly if you don't have that in your own data, you might want to look to secondary sources, maybe public statements firms have made out about changes of policies or there's I think it might have been Mark Anner, but someone I saw present talking about which firms paid and which firms didn't pay when COVID hit. Um, yeah, it might be helpful to bring in some other kinds of secondary sources of data. But yeah, overall, I think it's a really interesting paper and I'm looking forward to seeing how it turns out. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great comments. I was noting everything down. So re really useful. I, I know we're running out of time, so we can move on. But thank you so much. Thanks as right. well. Good questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to respond, but I think we don't have the time. Is that right? <laughs> Looking at the facilitator. Yes, yes. We are really running far beyond schedule. Yeah, so oh, I no. guess we're moving to the to the next presentation at once. Yeah. Thanks, Rachel. Over to you. I'll try and share again, and hopefully it works. Okay. This is not frozen, so good. For Looking good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so um, I'll be presenting a paper today that's also an early stage paper and yeah, happy to get any feedback and comments from the audience. Um, it's called Limitations for Market-Driven Sustainability Initiatives, um, Creating Regional Transformation and Global Production Networks. Um, it's a paper I'm working on with three co-authors Shikako Oka from the University of Paris East, Shahidur Rahman from Brack University, and Nicholas Egelzandin from the University of Gothenburg. So to start off, um, the paper is looking at what we call business case sustainability initiatives. Um, these are initiatives that 
um, as the name says, present a business case and they offer a proposition that says to a factory that says that you could have social and or environmental benefits at the same time as having economic benefits. So some examples might be um, a program focused on saving water like PACT in this slide where they say, um, if you put in this new equipment, you'll save um, costs and water usage, and at the same time, it's good for the environment. So they're win-win scenarios. Another type of initiative might be a women's empowerment program. That case and that type of initiative, the business case is not as immediately obvious, but the type of pitches they'll make is your workers will be happier, so they'll be more productive, you'll have less turnover, so then you'll have a social benefit as well as saving money in the long run with your better workforce. So when we look at these initiatives, um, and there's a lot of them coming out, they appear to be win-win. Um, but um, when we actually look at the impact, we don't see a very high uptake of these initiatives. They don't spread very much. They tend to all be small. New initiatives keep coming, but none of them actually grow. And if these pitches are so perfect. Why we want to ask why aren't more factories taking them up? And why don't they have more impact? What's wrong with this win-win? So um, the literature that we're looking at is drawing from the idea of upgrading. Um, we see these um, business case sustainability initiatives as a potential pathway to upgrading. Um, upgrading is changes that happen in a factory, and you could also have the contrast of downgrading. Um, some of the types of changes you could see in the theory of upgrading are product, process, functional, or chain. I won't go into all of them because we don't have a lot of time, but typically these BCSIs focus on functional upgrading, which means that they're changing how a factory functions, but you're not changing, sorry, process upgrading. You're changing how the, fact, the process is within the factory, but you're not changing the final product. Um, so it's all happening internally and it doesn't affect what the product at the end is. Um, upgrading can be considered as having economic, social, and environmental dimensions. And some research has looked at how do these different dimensions interact with each other. Um, for our purposes, we're saying that um, BCSIs offer um, synergistic upgrading, which means it's going upgrading along two dimensions at the same time. Um, the next thing that we I'm going to talk about is um, how we understand how upgrading happens. So we consider the fact that factories um, feel multiple pressures at the same time, and these can be both pressures for stability and pressures for change. So these could be new market trends, they could be buyer's demands. There's a whole bunch of things going on and factories um, experience all these different pressures in different directions. And then we come to looking at what is the driver they might have for an upgrading trajectory. Those can be split into external drivers and internal drivers. If you look at the external drivers, um, one might be joining a global value chain. And then another important issue is the vertical, which is the buyer pressures, and the horizontal, which are the local domestic pressures that they feel um, where they're producing. And then finally, the last type of um, theory that I'm going to mention is what, how does the process of upgrading happen? So if you look at what's happening within the factory, you can see that will be a learning process and that they also have to rely on their existing capabilities to be able to do some kind of process change. So um, to um, carry out our study, we focused on the case of Bangladesh's garment industry. Um, this is an industry that faces severe sustainability challenges, um, both social and environmental. It's also an industry where our place where there are many BCSIs being offered. They're both by um, global actors and by local actors. And it's a case where we see very few factories have participated in these initiatives. Um, so um, the data we have for our study is um, mainly interview data. We have um, 41 interviews with 39 factories and 32 of these factories had participated in a business case initiative and the others hadn't. And then we also have 47 interviews with a variety of other stakeholders. And additionally, we looked at documentary data, looking at how business case initiatives are run, and then secondary data to look at the characteristics of Bangladesh's garment industry. 
So um, first, um, to give some context, um, we considered what are the pressures that are felt by the Bangladeshi garment firms. Um, a key factor is that most of production is being is going to buyers in high income countries. Um, these buyers typically say they want sustainable production, but at the same time, they're creating a lot of um, downward pressures, which um, include the costs of compliance, uh, price squeeze, and the fast fashion trend, which is production having to go faster. Um, and a lot of um, new styles coming in quickly. We also can see that Bangladeshi garment factories um, experience some different horizontal pressures that take place within Bangladesh. So one issue is that the government has policies promoting export and the industry is very important to Bangladesh and provides a lot of revenue for the country. So it's a very important industry and there's been a lot of pressure to make it grow. And at the same time, we see some relatively weak um, government and NGO pressures promoting sustainable production. Um, if we look from the perspective of um, Bangladeshi garment firms, um, the different um, owners and managers can have different reactions to the sustainability challenges that they experience within their country. Um, each um, owner or manager might have their own priorities. And, and finally, each business might have its different levels of risk tolerance and literature particularly notes that smaller businesses might be, um, have a higher aversion to risk. Okay, so coming on to look at um, what we find about BCSIs in Bangladesh, um, we found there is very diverse initiatives. The ones I showed on the first page um, all are operating in Bangladesh. We find there are often um, pilot projects that are run through grants or global company CSR budgets. Um, some of the programs are offered to factories at little to no cost. Um, which is good in terms of getting more factories to join, but it means that working with each factory is expensive and they usually can't accept many factories. And on the other hand, some of the programs are offered with a full cost and they have a promise to the factories that they'll get a return on their investment after a few years. So we have both offering the basically free ones and ones that they're paying a cost. And we found factories participating in both. Um, coming on to look at um, how do the initiatives get new factories to join? Um, we see um, three different types of organizations running the BCSIs. Um, I'll start with um, the specific organizations that are developed just to run a business case sustainability initiative. Um, they have um, three different options for approaching factories. One is going directly to the factory. Um, when they do this, um, they found they often had a credibility problem, so it's actually quite a rare way for them to work. Another option is they approach the buyers and get them on board and have the buyers um, speak to their factory. This is, is a much more effective way if they can find a partner buyer. And a third um, option is to work with um, a local intermediary, which can be a producer association, and that also is a way that gives them a lot more credibility. Um, when we look at um, which factories these um, BCSI organizations want to approach, if they're the kind that are um, run by a grant or funders, um, they want to have um, high success. So they'll end up trying to approach producers where they feel like the project will work well. So they end up going to the best performing producers. Um, then second, if we look at the um, a producer association who can also um, be running a business case sustainability initiative, if they are all facilitating the connection for a dedicated organization, their um, initiative to go to a factory is to help their members. So in that case, they might have a more um, diversified approach. They might offer the initiative to all of their members. They want to help everyone in the industry. Um, and then thirdly, if we look at buyers top down approach, um, they have the same initiative, um, same motivation of they want their um, program to be successful as the dedicated organization. So they'll also approach just the best firms and the best factories, because two of these pathways only go to the best factories. What we found is that the best factories get offered business case sustainability initiatives over and over again. They're inundated with them. 
and the worst performing factories almost never get offered an initiative. Um, and then one other final point here is that if it's the buyer offering the initiative, the factories almost always say yes, because they wanna do whatever their buyer says, they wanna keep their buyer, even if it's offered as voluntary, there is an element of buyer power. So buyer pathway makes factories say yes, almost every time. I don't think we found a case where a buyer, no, maybe one case where a buyer offered it and the factory said no. Sorry, I think, I don't know if you can hear me, my computer is frozen again. I can hear you. Okay, there. Um, so um, if we look um, at the factories that do participate in the initiatives, um, we found um, three different issues that result in factories um, not having a successful change. The first one is um, lack of internal commitment. So this was very common when the initiative was introduced by a buyer, the factory said, they just said yes to the initiative, but they didn't put any effort into it. If it involved a training program, they attended the training. If it involved changes to the factory, they just said like, yes, yes, we'll do them, but they didn't actually do that. This isn't the case for all the factories, but it was definitely a common dynamic when the buyer had introduced the initiative. Um, Another problem we found when um, factories participated in these initiatives is that they had a lack of internal resources. Um, the initiatives do provide a lot of support, but they might provide training to um, someone at the management level, but then that manager has to provide training maybe to all the workers and they don't have the skills to do that training. If the initiative involved restructuring um, production to put in new water treatment facilities, they might not have the technical skills. Sometimes. The factory said that they had to hire new people to actually run these initiatives. And in other cases, this lack of internal resources meant that they couldn't be successful with the initiative. And then finally, a third issue we found for factories that participated um, that didn't go on to keep up the changes that were part of the initiative was that it was very rare to actually measure the impact. So some of them didn't know if it worked or not, and then they stopped doing it. And this is particularly the case with social initiatives. So something like women's empowerment, they didn't actually measure, did this affect their turnover, things like that. They just did the program for the six months they were a participant and then stopped doing it and they didn't know if it helped or not. In one case that was a water saving initiative, we interviewed two different staff members and one said it had a measurable impact and the other one said it didn't. So we can see there's just a lack of systematic measuring and some of these changes aren't obvious and factories may or may not continue to do them if they don't even know if it's saving them money or addressing a sustainability challenge. So um, to bring this all together, um, we see um, two different places where we lose the big group of all the factories. There are thousands of factories in Bangladesh. We see that only some of them get targeted and only some of them agree to join out of the ones that are targeted. And it's actually very few who even get offered to participate in these initiatives. And then at the second level, if we look at the firms that do participate, we have the three factors I just mentioned, which lead to very few factories actually participating in these initiatives and leading to a behavior change. So um, just to wrap up, we can see um, that the market for these initiatives is actually pretty small. It's not a case where every factory is going to join and make these changes. Um, if we look at the implications of this, um, we can see that these initiatives do have some success. Some of the programs um, have published reports where they show the great success they've had. They maybe worked with dozens of factories, sometimes hundreds, but usually more like a handful. And they can make a change, but it's quite a small change. So um, looking at how can this change be actually scaled up if the initiatives themselves can't work with that many factories. One is to continue on the path that they're on now where they typically work with best performing factories and maybe they're creating role model factories and that these might create some imitation effect in the future. Another option is that they change their targeting strategies and focus on the worst performing factories because those are almost never getting offered to participate in these initiatives and they probably have the most room to improve and that can address the worst behavior in the industry. 
And then finally, another kind of different way to look at these initiatives is to see them as real royal trials where they run these new um, technologies or new ways of managing a factory with a small amount of firms, and then they can identify best practices and someone else can take up the mantle and provide um, training to a broader amount of factories through a different format, such as a local training program where many factories come in and take it, or maybe a policy incentive to promote a uh, particular technology that's shown to be very effective at saving energy. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice presentation. Uh, may I now invite Bay to, to give her comment, her discussion on the paper. So please, uh, we have four minutes for that so that we can move into the general section. So I encourage you to keep to the four minutes. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to discuss this very interesting paper. So. Before writing the wage paper I presented, I lived the life as a qualitative researcher doing field work in Myanmar's garment industry. Um, and those who were on the field, I'm sure have recognized this lot of business case sustainability initiatives um, operating in the local apparel industry and how they can potentially play a very crucial role in the industry development, um, the industry's uptake on sustainability issues. So in that sense, I think this paper is really timely and also addresses surprisingly an underexplored topic on how these initiatives operate, how suppliers perceive and react to these initiatives, and also why these initiatives have not led to lasting and industry level uh, transformation that allows these sustainability practices to settle in locally. And I think also another unique strength of this paper comes from its uh, rich and multifaceted uh, qualitative data that captures the perspectives of the initiative implementers, participants, as well as stakeholders. So I, I understand that this paper is a work in progress. So I just come up with, I guess, uh, several points based on how this paper can enhance storytelling in view of the research question that it sets out to ask. So, I, I wonder whether it was a strategic decision from the authors to focus on understanding the barriers of implementing these initiatives at the supply, supplier level, but I think it's worth digging deeper into um, barriers experienced by the implementers of the initiatives themselves. So, for example, at the recruitment uh, level, it's possible that um, these implementers, they operate with time and funding constraints that last three to five years. So that means they are incentivized to work with already well-functioning and management savvy garment factories. And I think it's already mentioned and alluded in the paper. And, but the problem is, as we know, if this kind of trend continues, the industry may see growing bifurcation in factories ability to realize synergistic upgrading. So, I think in that sense, it's worth looking into the recruitment barriers experienced by the implementers of the initiatives. Um, so in relation to that, personally, I'd like to see the authors to consider uh, the recruitment, uh, recruitment and implementation barriers as experienced by the initiative implementers and incorporate them possibly in the model, which is visualized in figure three. I think this will give a more fuller and interactive picture of why these well-intentioned sustainability initiatives, despite their obvious selling points, have not generated transformation at the industry level. And I think another aspect uh, that this model can contemplate upon is the barriers to industry level diffusion. Because as you mentioned, this initiative is a small market, only few factories participate, so it becomes then very important for success stories to be replicated, promoted, and become a new norm, fashion, or trend, or a rule at the industry level. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to learn more about why that's being hindered. What are the barriers of diffusion to the higher level, be that the country level or um, industry level, whether there have been some active resi uh, resistance or deterrence by stakeholders, et cetera. 
I think the study paints an aggregate, aggregate picture of these initiatives. Um, but as mentioned in the paper, the initiatives are diverse and numerous in formats um, and various other attributes. So I'm personally curious whether certain types of initiatives were more or less successful and whether this is something that the authors want to explore as they revise the paper. Because even if the paper retains an aggregate view of these initiatives, um, it'll be helpful for readers to know what kind of initiatives were in operation, how they differ from each other in a comparative table or so. So that would be just a summary of my uh, discussion and I'd be happy to follow up over email later on. Thank you very much. That's really helpful, thank you. So thank you everybody. Thanks to the presenters and thanks to the discussants. Uh, sorry, we are on our toes on the time. So, but I encourage the discussants to try as much as possible to share your comments with the presenters. Uh, and also let's keep the conversation going after that. So on that note, uh, I, we have come to the end of this section and I kindly employ uh, everybody to now join section A for the closing remarks. Thank you very much for your time.